In Wednesday's violence, three journalists were among the dead. Two of them were shot to death. The cause of death for the third is unknown. Their deaths underscore the risk journalists take covering conflict zones. Our guest today, Abigail Hausloner, is the Cairo bureau chief for the Washington Post and was caught in the crossfire on the streets of Cairo, and she is joining us. Uh, we said at the top of the broadcast that President Obama on Thursday condemned the bloody crackdown in Egypt, and we'll talk more about that in just one moment. But Abigail, I want to thank you so much for taking some time to speak with us, and I want to talk about your personal experiences. But before we do, how much violence continues even now? Hi, thank you for having me. Um, r right now, uh, violence is continuing, as you noted. Uh, it's unclear uh, how exactly uh, yesterday's crackdown is is likely to regain stability, which is what the interim government said their intention was behind the crackdown. Uh, as you said, we've seen uh, today uh, protesters storm government offices. We've seen a continuation of clashes in cities across the country between Morsi supporters and security forces, and also between Morsi supporters uh, and Egyptians who oppose uh, the Islamists. So it's looking like a very chaotic situation for days to come. We indeed heard a report this morning about a government building being set on fire in, in Cairo. Do you know any more about that? And has anyone claimed responsibility? It's a very hazy situation here right now with a lot uh, of rhetoric sort of coming from both sides uh, and a lot of rumors. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood has maintained that it's demonstrations are peaceful and that the police is to blame for all of the violence. Of course, we've seen videos uh, that appear to show protesters carrying automatic weapons and hurling stones. Uh, at the same time, it also appears clear that most of the dead from yesterday are uh, protesters, Brotherhood supporters, uh, and that the police used excessive force uh, in dealing with those sit-ins. So, uh, as far as what's happening right now across the country and the storming of these government buildings and the clashes that are erupting, it's all very hazy. Uh, it, it appears that protesters are involved uh, in setting off some of the violence. In other cases, uh, they may well be uh, on the receiving end. It's very, a very difficult to tell right now. You experienced this firsthand yesterday uh, during the military crackdown. Tell us about your experience. Well, I arrived at the sit-in, the main sit-in, Nuraba Ladawiya, yesterday, uh, early in the morning, about an hour after the raid started, and it was a pretty hectic situation. It looked like a war zone. There was smoke coming out of the area. Things were on fire. Uh, tear gas and bullets were flying, and the police uh, were very hostile to reporters. We got, my team and I got a few threats, including a direct threat from a police officer who said that if he saw us again, he would shoot us. And this was after telling us to clear the area. Uh, so, And we were later then pinned down uh, as gunfire erupted around us. And a few of my colleagues, as you noted, other journalists were shot uh, yesterday, and three of them were killed. Another friend of mine, a fantastic photojournalist for Reuters, is in the hospital at the moment after being shot in the leg. Uh, so it's unclear whether the government uh, or whether the security forces were targeting journalists, uh, but it is clear that many journalists were caught in the crossfire, and, uh, and we were all clearly identified as members of the press. That must have been a terrifying experience for you, Abigail. It, it is very frightening. I've uh, covered now four different war zones, and it never... Uh, becomes any less scary uh, when you hear bullets uh, whizzing past you uh, and the explosions and even the thunders of, of tear gas canisters being fired. It's a very frightening experience. Uh, and I know a lot of Egyptians uh, who were there, residents witnessing it, uh, were very disturbed and upset by what they saw. Yeah, understandably so. Depending on who you believe, both sides are blaming the other. Morsi supporters saying it is the military that is uh, uh, being brutal and the aggressor. It is the, the military is saying that Muslim Brotherhood supporters, pro-Morsi supporters, are also violent, said that they've carry, they are carrying automatic weapons and attacking the military. Based on what you saw, who's the aggressor? or more of the aggressor? 
Uh, the security forces at this point are clearly uh, have clearly used excessive force. Uh, they are better armed than the protesters. I saw security forces yesterday uh, carrying assault rifles, other types of handguns, uh, and also uh, ordinary rifles for birdshot. Uh, as well as guns that I was not able to identify. Uh, they are well armed and they were using gunfire, live ammunition yesterday. I saw and heard quite a bit of it, uh, and it was coming from the police. So uh, today I moved around the city and I saw, I counted personally more than 200 bodies uh, of Morsi supporters. Those are just the bodies that still have yet to be buried or even cataloged by the morgue. Uh, so it's quite clear that the death toll was very high on the protesters' side. My goodness. You know, the, it, in many reports, even before this crackdown leading up to the ousting of uh, Morsi, there was seemed to be great popular support for the, mil the military stepping in. wonder, does the uh, public still support the military in view of, of this latest crackdown? Well, the public, as you said, was absolutely uh, very supportive of the military, too. Uh, they had wide support for it. There was a lot of anti-Islamist sentiment. Right now, we're seeing a society deeply divided. It's not clear yet. It's too early to tell uh, how the events of yesterday and the continuing violence are going to sway the public, uh, or if there are even people who are still on the fence at this point, and whether they'll... Uh, sway to one side or the other as violence continues. Uh, what we do know is it, it does seem like the Islamists may still be in the minority, uh, but they are a sizable minority, and they are not going to quiet down uh, because these protests have been crushed. Uh, on another but related note, I want to ask you about an experience that we had right here in the Arise News newsroom. I went online to read your uh, headline report on the Washington Post uh, website, and as I tried to click through your story, the page was hijacked uh, by, by a group that had Arabic language on there. Can you tell us about what happened there? That's right. We're the Washington Post. We're the latest of a number of news organizations now who have been hacked. Uh, our website was hacked today by uh, the Syrian Electronic, um, the Syrian Electronic Army. It's mm -hmm. a it's a hacker collective that supports the Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Uh, we know that they hacked our website today. They've hacked a number of other news websites, and the Post is currently working to resolve that issue. Um, but that is, that's all I know at this time. I've been out in the field in Egypt all day, uh, and hopefully it gets resolved soon. Indeed, I'm sure it's perplexing. And uh, this, by the way, was the same organization that hacked into the Associated Press website as well. Abigail Hauslohner, thank you so much for taking some time. You take good care of yourself. My pleasure. Thank you. As we said at the top of the broadcast, President Barack Obama on Thursday condemned the bloody crackdown in Egypt and said normal U.S. cooperation could not continue with the country while civilians were being killed. Meanwhile, as Mana Rabi'i reports, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry called the crisis a revolution yet to be decided. Today's events are deplorable. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry in no uncertain terms condemned the violence in Egypt that made Wednesday the bloodiest day there in decades. Violence is simply not a solution in Egypt or anywhere else. Violence will not create a roadmap for Egypt's future. The violence began in Cairo. The clashes spread to other cities, Alexandria, Ismailia, Suez and elsewhere. <laughs> The violence threatens to polarize Egypt even further following its 2011 revolution. But Kerry says he's convinced the path to political dialogue remains open. And the final outcome of that revolution is not yet decided. It will be shaped in the hours ahead, in the days ahead. It will be shaped by the decisions which all of Egypt's political leaders make now and in these days ahead. What does lie ahead is emergency law, which the military-backed government announced on Wednesday, as well as nighttime curfews for at least a month, it said, or until further notice. With us now is Ivan Elin, who is the senior fellow and director of the Center on Peace and Liberty at the Independent Institute. Ivan, thank you so much for taking some time with us. Uh, I want to start with this question. How 
how much longer can the U.S. avoid calling this a coup? Well, I don't think they should avoid it any longer. They're still holding this, uh, uh, you know, they say it's deplorable, uh, they condemn the violence, and yet they don't say it's a coup for legal reasons because they would have to suspend the $1.3 billion in aid. They don't want to do that because basically uh, this, de rec uh, this rhetoric of democracy that the administration is putting out is contrary to what the administration vows, uh, you know, feels as U.S. interests, and that is supporting the uh, Egyptian military, which has done since the Camp David Accords in the late 70s, uh, in order to keep the peace with Israel. And Israel is at the center of this, even though you never hear it mentioned. And so the U.S. has to keep, they, they feel they have to keep supporting uh, the Egyptian military, no matter what they do. And it's going to be it's going to be really uh, embarrassing if they if the violence uh, gets worse and and the military was clearly in violation here it certainly is a coup uh, and it's it's it even undermines us law by not calling it a coup because when you ta take over a, an elected government you shoot people in the streets three times uh, a peaceful protest and these guns that we hear about on the brotherhood uh, even if they are shooting guns they're shooting back in return for being attacked by the military, and this is just sporadic. So these were basically peaceful protests. And so I don't know how you couldn't call it a coup, uh, but that's the reason they're not. As we both know, President Obama made remarks uh, just this morning during his uh, vacation from Martha's Vineyard. He, of course, condemned the violence. He implored Egypt to choose a peaceful res res revolution. He announced counseling biannual joint military exercises, uh, also encouraged Egypt to respect the right of women and religious organizations in the country, said a, a lot of things. However, the U.S. is being blamed on both sides uh, for either action or inaction. Can we win at all in this situation? Well, I think the reason that we're being blamed, uh, we don't have that much influence over the Egyptians since uh, the Saudis and uh, the Gulf states have give them 10 to 15 billion dollars in aid we only give them 1.3 in in, bill, in uh, military aid and of course our military is the best in the world our equipment is the best in the world so they need that aid but nonetheless i think other countries have much more influence over us and uh i but i think that's not the perception in the arab world simply because since world war ii we've We've intervened repeatedly in the Islamic world, uh, some, many times for very questionable reasons. And people just find, you know, we find it weird that they think there's a U.S. is behind every conspiracy and they have this conspiracy mentality. But some of the, there's a kernel of truth to that in that the U.S. has been the most interventionist uh, country uh, in the region uh, since World War II. And Americans don't realize how many times we've intervened in the Arab and Muslim world. And I think that's why you're getting uh, the blowback. It's going to take a long time, even if the U.S. Uh, quit doing those unnecessary interventions. It would take a long time for that to, uh, you know, uh, be in, become in the popular uh, uh, perceptions of the people in the region and, and particularly in Egypt. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, from your point of view, who is in the best position to uh, bring some stabilization and some re resolution, whether it's an individual inside e Egypt or an entity or government outside Egypt? Well, I don't think uh, the United States should be messing with it. I think we should stand on principle. I don't think there's any reason not to and cut off the aid as well as these exercises, which, are, which is good that the president cut those off. But I think we ought to cut the aid. Uh, the Egyptian military does depend on that. They could get aid from someplace else. But uh, uh, really, I think uh, the United States could do that much. But I don't think the United States should take it upon itself uh, to interfere in the internal affairs of other countries. So we're just in the habit of doing that. And Egypt is an important country, and you hope that the people can live in peace. But, uh, you know, when the, when the government takes over, you can't expect people not to fight back. I mean, we fought back against the British and the American Revolution, but now we're all for, uh, you know, uh, keeping the violence down. You certainly don't want to see any unnecessary violence, but if people are attacked, I'm not sure that uh, they should they have the means to do so. Now, I think it's better to, to use peaceful tactics, and I think the Muslim Brotherhood is smart to say, hey, listen, we're going to continue with our peaceful tactics. But uh, So I think that the internal people in Egypt should be left to work this out, and it may be uh, more violence than we'd like to see, but I, I'm not sure outside uh, entities are, are going to help things, and it'll probably hurt. I mean, look at what's happened in Syria. Uh, that started out with peaceful protests there. The regime 
uh, repress them, and now they have a civil war. We may be headed there in Egypt. I hope not. But I think, uh, I think uh, you know, when you retaliate like this, the peaceful uh, people, they, they seem to want to defend themselves, which I think is a normal uh, response. We, we have a problem identifying with the Muslim Brotherhood simply because they're so religious and they're from a different religion uh, and that sort of thing. But uh, they're not necessarily terrorists. In fact, they've been a mainstream organization mm -hmm. uh, opposed to the government of Egypt for uh, decades. All right. Ivan Elin, thank you so much. It's good to see you. Thank you. Take care.